Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes him pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Welcome back to episode 144 of The Last Round. Thank you again for joining us. No Mike Shepard this week. It's just me, um, but I'm not writing solo. I actually have a special guest, uh, a Southern California journalist and writer, I believe, is how he would like to be introduced, unless he says something different. Um, I remember he was one of the first people I met here on the boxing scene in Southern California, primarily in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he's a writer for the Press, Enterfri- Press Enterprise in uh, Riverside, California, and he currently writes also for the SweetScience.com and has written for other uh, publications in the past. He's been all over the boxing beat for many, many years. Writer and journalist David Avila joins me this week on The Last Round. Thank you for joining me, David. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Danny. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate it. So as I mentioned just before we came on air, uh, Dave, you know, before we kind of get into the fights and reviews and previews for our guests who might not be aware of your work, uh, of course, a lot of Southern California boxing fans, especially the hardcore scene, uh, are aware of your work and they know who you are. But for our guests, for example, as I mentioned, for, uh, for our listeners, excuse me, across the pond and all over the world who might not be familiar with you, uh, who is David Avila and how did he get into the boxing beat here in Southern California? Well, I actually come from a, a family of boxers that go back all more than 100 years. And uh, my great grandfather was a boxer who went by the name of Battling Ortega, fought from like 1916 to the 1930, I think it was. And then my dad boxed too. And uh, we boxed as amateurs, me and my brothers. And then, um, but I knew boxing wasn't for me. And uh, I pursued journalism while at UCLA, uh, studying history. And uh, I started working for newspapers there at the school. And then um, after I graduated, it was hard to find a job. So this, this is during the 1980s. So somebody asked me to write for a small news, newspaper that he had. They had like a circulation of about 300 or something like that. So he said, you can write whatever you want. And I said, uh, I don't know what to write, you know, because he wrote, he had a, a weekly newspaper. And the only thing that made sense was boxing. So I started writing on boxing. The very first fight I covered was uh, Hagler versus uh, um, Tommy Hearns. And that was the very first fight I covered. And from there on, it it was kind of a successful little thing. I did that off and on for about four years. And then uh, I switched over to just hard news. And uh, while I was working for the LA Times, they asked me to cover uh, some new kid on the block, uh, Oscar De Loya. <laughs> they asked me if I knew anything about boxing or if I knew anything about East LA. I said, well, that's where I live. And I come from a boxing family. And from there on, I kind of switched gears, went from hard news and politics to boxing. And I just stayed with it. And that was like 1993. And as I mentioned initially, Dave, uh, you know, currently you write for like the Sweet Science. And I believe you're still with the Press Enterprise here in the Riverside, California area. Uh, what other publications, whether it was digital uh, or, or newspaper, physical newspapers, or anything of that matter. What other publications did you contribute to over the, over the last several years? I also uh, work with La Prensa newspaper, Spanish uh, language newspaper in the Inland Empire. And um, I also am the managing editor of the prizefighters.com, which is dedicated to women only. And then I also co own uh, Uppercut Magazine. Uppercut Magazine, that's what I wanted to touch on. That's the one thing I forgot. Um, can you touch on that? Because obviously, we, you know, there's not too many boxing magazines 
in circulation anymore. Um, I mean, you have obviously the Ring Magazine, which is probably the most well known. Um, you had Boxing Monthly, but I believe they were uh, they they are now defunct um, within the last couple of years. Um, Boxing Social, one of our partners, uh, has a digital magazine. I'm not sure if they've actually come out with the physical one, but how does how, how does Uppercut Magazine work? Do you guys have a physical? Uh, print in circulation as well, or is it mostly uh, a website at the moment? Uh, it's mostly a website. We still do uh, print, uh, not as large numbers as we did when we first started. We started about 1996, or is it 1995, one of those years. But we've been continuous since then, and we're more of a West Coast-oriented magazine. We used, we used to be bilingual, but uh, we decided that it was uh, not really fruit, fruitful enough to do bilingual, but it's still out there. We're still doing it. We don't have a large uh, circulation, but the website is up and we we still have that. And that's where we're, we're I handle mostly the website. Uh, the, the actual owner, I own 25%. The actual 50% owner, he handles most of the print uh, magazine. But right now, ever since... Um, 2008, things got very tough for any kind of uh, hardcore, uh, hard copy magazine. You mentioned earlier uh, how you initially covered, you know, other categories in 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 the newspaper, politics, you know, society or economics or or what have you, economy and stuff like that. And then you were asked about covering uh, a young man named Oscar De La Hoya from East L.A., um, can you tell me about your first experience with Oscar De La Hoya, especially when you were able to speak to him and what your impression was initially? Uh, when I first spoke to him, uh, it was in a small dojo in Big Bear. And uh, he was working out. I, I forget what fight he was preparing for. But I interviewed him with just me and him in a little uh, room. And he was very shy, <laughs> very extremely shy. And uh, it was hard to get anything out of him. And, uh, but, you know, he, he was very cordial. He was always a, a, a nice person. And, um, you know, I, I could see that he had that barrier. And it took him a while to get out of it. But now you talk to him and he's, you know, very well-spoken and, and very confident. And now he's a owner of a mega boxing company. So that first time, what what year was that when you first were up in Big Bear that first time you were able to speak to him face-to-face? I think it was either 1993 or 94. He had just started. He he, he didn't yet have a world title. Mm-hmm. I don't think he had a world title at the time. He, he might have. He might have already fought Jimmy Breedall, but I'm not positive. When did you know? Because obviously, you know, um, especially us in the boxing circles, we see something or we see a fighter and, and we, we think, Oh, you know, that guy's special that, you know, she's special, she's special, he's special. You know, you can just kind of have a feeling. Um, but it's always, you know, ultimately a guess, uh, at the end of the day, when did you know, at what fight was it when you knew, when you knew, okay, this Oscar De La Hoya kid, he's, he's got something, he's, he's going to be something and he's probably going to make a lot of money. Um, I think it was during the Olympics, actually, when, when I saw his hand speed and uh, the way he just seemed to touch people and would knock them down. That kind of told me that he had that special something. The, the only thing is that there's a lot of kids that have that kind of hand speed. It always comes down to the chin. And that was really the test for Oscar De Loya. He would get knocked down early on, but he'd always get up as a Nothing happened, and uh, that kind of told me he has a chin. He get, he gets knocked down mainly because he had a balance problem in the beginning, and then later uh, I forget who it was. I think it was a uh, Rivero that kind of uh, Rivero or Emmanuel Stewart that fixed that problem, that balance problem. And once he once he corrected that, he was pretty hard to knock down. In fact, he really had had a punch to to drop him, and but he always had a punch too. What do you think out of all the trainers that Oscar De La Hoya had, uh, you know, he had multiple trainers over his career, uh, Floyd Mayweather Sr., Nacho Berenstein. Um, out of the ones he had, especially since you were able to cover him since essentially the inception and even, you know, a little bit prior maybe to, uh, to his career beginning, 
Um, who do you think was the best trainer that fit with him? He says Floyd Mayweather Sr., but do you agree with that? Um, I think in terms of defense, yes, absolutely. Because Mayweather kind of showed him a different defensive technique, and uh, he was harder to hit after that. Before, he used to just rely on his legs and his gloves. But after Mayweather, he knew about angles, about slipping punches, about uh, – he he just was a well-rounded fighter after Mayweather, but offensively, I always kind of liked uh, uh, Emmanuel Stewart because Emmanuel always taught that that um, very uh, what's the word? Kind of like Tommy Hearns, he just went after you, you know. And w- once he got behind, uh, he got with Emmanuel. Then he became like that, very offensive-minded. <clears throat> Which which fight throughout his career? Because I'm sure you were there at numerous ones ringside. Um, which fight out of in in all of his career really kind of struck you like this is a spectacle? Obviously, he had quite a few, especially after the the Chavez fight um, in the in the late '90s. Um, but which one kind of sticks out in your mind? If you can just choose one that really says like, man, like this is bigger than boxing. Like this guy and maybe his opponent, whether it was Mayweather or not, are really bigger than the sport? Ooh, that's a good question. That's hard to say. Um, I think, uh, I, I know for me, the one that that meant the most in terms of uh, uh, seeing him break out was uh, when he fought uh, Ruelas, Rafael Ruelas. That was his first Las, big Las Vegas fight. The stands were were packed. It was L.A. versus L.A. Um, you know, he's from East L.A. Ruelas was from San Fernando Valley. Uh, they both had their their fans. Were both world titles. They both had a world title, and then it just ended so quickly. It was like that was that pretty much convinced everybody this guy's for real because the way he took out Ruelas was just like uh, spectacular. And uh, that was the same night that Gabriel has also fought. Mm-hmm. He fought Jimmy Garcia, who passed away from injuries during that fight. And um, so people kind of forget uh, that he fought uh, Rafael Ruelas because it kind of gets lost in the in the tragedy that happened uh, just before. Besides Oscar De La Hoya, obviously, obviously he's one of the more prominent. Uh, you know, characters and fighters in the sport, especially in the last, you know, 20, 25 years or so. Um, who's somebody else that really stands out in your career that you've talked to or you had a chance to talk to or cover? Um, you know, obviously you're still going, you're still covering the sport, but if, you know, if your career stopped today and you're like, oh, you know what, I think it's time to retire, which I know you're, you're I don't think you're ready to, but um, who else, who else pops up in your mind besides an Oscar De La Hoya? Um, there's, um, Sugar Shane Mosley, uh, because they started almost basically the same time. And at the beginning, very few people knew about Sugar Shane. And, uh, you just knew that they were headed towards showdowns. Um, that was a big fight. That fight in Staples Center was, uh, massive. I, I remember the, the people that showed up for that fight. I had never seen anybody, any kind of boxing card that, that, uh, had that kind of crowd show up. I mean, it was the Hollywood crowd. It was a sports world. It was uh, everybody just wanted to be at that fight. And the array of celebrities passing by the tunnel, everybody would go, ooh, ah, because it was somebody that they knew, and they, they kind of didn't expect that in a boxing fight. Well, they hadn't seen that kind of stuff since maybe uh, Art Aragon in the 50s and in early 60s. And then here comes Oscar, and he brings that same kind of celebrity. And uh, I always remember the biggest uh, cheer was when uh, Muhammad Ali walked through, hmm. and then the whole place erupted. And um, it was funny because the fights were going on, and here comes Muhammad, and everybody noticed, everybody. <laughs> and it was kind of nice, special. So, you know, obviously, I, I think, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but De La Hoya, especially late nineties and throughout the two thousands, at least, you know, the first 
essentially decade, maybe until he fought Mayweather, was uh, was obviously the money guy um, to fight. He was the star power of this, or at least you know, if you arguably the star power of the sport um, before Mayve- before Mayweather. Uh, before the Mayweather fight, and then when Mayweather won, and obviously, I guess took the reins and became the money guy for the next several years um, after his his win against Oscar De La Hoya. Was there anyone in between that Oscar fought, or maybe didn't fight that you had seen that you thought, you know what, this guy could be the next star, the next, you know. I don't want to say next Oscar de la Hoya, but something, you know, close in terms of star power, like you said, drawing out the celebrities and, and stuff like that. Was there anybody in between prior to the Mayweather, to the Mayweather fight that you thought, uh, this guy might, might take it. I, he's got some type of potential, but it just never panned out. Yeah. I, I, I guess you could say that about Fernando Vargas. He was really rising up there and uh, he had the same kind of appeal uh, he was a rougher guy and 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 had a, a a different kind of support, but you could tell that people were getting behind him, celebrities, everybody, and uh, then they had their showdown and and but by that time he had already fought Tito. He fought Tito in '99, and uh, that was a great fight. People forget that it was actually pretty close, even though uh, Fernando got dropped right away. He came, he stormed back, dropped Tito, and then uh, Tito hit him low, and then that kind of changed everything around. And, and little by little, uh, Tito was like a freight train and just came on, and and then he ended that fight. Uh, I think it was the 11th round or something like that. But Fernando was way up there. He was really moving in that direction. And then uh, when he met um, Oscar, that was pretty much the the apex of his his career and it was that was a big fight that was one of the, the best fight cards I ever saw in Las Vegas I'd say because it had everybody wanted to see that fight and it was sold out and Las Vegas was really jumping and it only jumped like that I'd say maybe in in all the years I've been covering it I've only seen crowds like that maybe four times where it was just everybody wanted to be there. Las Vegas was like packed. Um, it was like that also when uh, Oscar fought uh, Julio Cesar Chavez. And it was also like that uh, when Ricky Hatton fought, uh, uh, I forget if it was Floyd or or Manny Pacquiao. Um, yes, one of those. It was Ricky Hatton, though. Mm. And uh, it was just packed. I mean... Hatton, I remember because they sold they sold out of beer, which is unheard of in Las Vegas. They ran out of beer. The darn uh, Brits came over and drank all the beer. <laughs> that yeah. was hilarious. But hey, that was great that they they came. So many British fans came over and they they didn't even have rooms. They were sleeping in hallways and sleeping in bars and sleeping in in uh, nightclubs and stuff. It was hilarious. Yeah, definitely. The the Brits can drink, and then I, you know, I, Mike, my co-host Mike, Mike Shepard is British, and trust me, I've I've been at a bar with the guy, and he can definitely beat me to the punch. So, oh yeah, 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 they definitely can drink, but they're fun, they man. Drink I, any Mexican. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that's and that's a statement, and that's a de- that's a definite <laughs> statement too. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you said, they, uh, I definitely agree with the especially when British fans are able to come to the United States, especially at a fight town like Vegas, it's uh, it's definitely a lot funner. They make the, the, you know, the vibrant atmosphere a lot funner, you know, 10 times, 20 times funner than, than it can be, which is crazy because it's already usually typically a great atmosphere and it becomes even more eccentric. Um, what, what fight stands out? You know, this one last question before we kind of go into the reviews and, and, and everything of, of the rest of the episode here, Dave. Um, what fight as of today that you've covered really stands out in your mind that, yeah, I know you mentioned De La Hoya Vargas. Um, so obviously besides that one, and I mean, if it is that one, then just say it, but which one stands out that you were right there uh, ringside covering and you kind of, whether it was during the fight or after the event, when you kind of really knew like, man, I was, 
I was there for a moment in time. Like this was historic. This wasn't just history and boxing. That was going to, this is going to be like in the history books, uh, in, you know, in the world going forward. Huh, that's hard to, it's hard to answer. Maybe if I thought about it for a while, but, um, um, the one that fit that I wasn't at the fight. I actually saw, saw it on a big screen at Poly Pavilion was a thrill in Manila when, uh, when they both fought that final fight, uh, Frazier and Ali. And I was at Poly Pavilion and it was packed mm-hmm. and everybody saw it on the screen. And, uh, I remember that fight was exactly what you said, where I, I knew that this was going to be historically relevant for forever because it just, it, there was a final chapter and, and it kind of, um, uh, I mean, Ali was like a a superhero. I mean, he after that, he was even bigger than ever. He, he was big after Foreman, and then after beating Frazier for that final time, that was that was immense. Yeah, I'll never forget that. Yeah, that was definitely a moment in time. Muhammad Ali was a was a definitely a historical figure in time, and and not just a boxing figure, but like I said, you know, definitely a historical figure in the history of the world. Moving on to our fight reviews this past Friday, the 10th of September on ESPN plus from Arizona, um, sanctioned by a tribal commission in Arizona. Oscar Valdez gets the unanimous decision win over Robson Consencio. I hope I pronounced that right. Who suffers the first loss of his career. Um, before we kind of get into the circumstances that were surrounding this fight, uh, you know, primarily with Valdez, Dave, um, you know, what'd you think of the fight itself? Cause the first couple of, you know, roughly the first half of the fight, maybe the five, six rounds, uh, Consencio seemed like, to, like he had a pretty good con- control of the rhythm of the fight. Um, but what'd you think overall? Well, I, honestly, I didn't get to see the whole fight. I just saw clips of it. Um, I actually thought that Oscar Valdez was going to have an easy, easier time because, uh before fighting Valdez, um uh Robinson had fought uh Louis Coria, who trains with uh with uh, Robert Garcia in Riverside. And Coria had a pretty easy time with it. Well not easy, but let's just say he almost beat him. So I figured, oh well, Valdez is gonna mow this guy down. And it didn't happen. And uh it's one of those things where styles make fights. And uh maybe Robinson underestimated Louis uh, Coria and uh but he was well prepared for Oscar Valdez. And that's the only thing I could think of because Valdez is Valdez kind of fights down to the opposition. If the opposition isn't that good, he doesn't fight that good. If they're a great opposition, he fights better. It just seems to be a style. Is it? I think I read something, and maybe I'm I'm wrong, but I feel like I read something prior to the fight that that said that Valdez and Robson had met prior to turning pro, um, and that Robson actually beat him. Is that is that true? Or am I or am I misremembering that? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't I don't recall reading that anywhere. Um, okay, I feel I, like I know that he's Olympian, but I would think that uh, Oscar Valdez would be way too old for him. Right. I don't know. I really don't know. Right. I, maybe I, I saw it. Maybe I, maybe I misremember something, but I, I, I was talking to, to Mike about that um, off the air and I feel like we, he saw it too, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe sometimes I, I needed sleep. Maybe it was late at night or early in the morning. <laughs> I was just, wasn't paying attention. Um, but obviously, as I mentioned, Valdez gets the win by scores of 117, 110 and 115, 112 twice. Um, and the biggest news that kind of surrounded this fight, as we know, and as our listeners know, is that Valdez prior to the fight tested positive for fentermine. Uh, yeah. Fentermine. And people thought that the fight would be canceled. It'd be postponed because he, you know, obviously tested positive, but it still proceeded, um, which got a, gained a lot of criticism um, from fans and the public. Um, when he, when you heard, when you read the news that, Valdez had tested positive. What was your initial reaction? Um, initially, I was wondering, okay, what was it? What kind of uh, 
drug was it because there's diuretics and there's enhancement drugs and in this case it wasn't an enhancement drug it was a diuretic which gives you an advantage in terms of losing weight but it doesn't really make you physically stronger it doesn't give you that kind of advantage that that's the one thing i knew but i did think they were going to cancel the fight or postpone it so why do you think they actually proceeded with the fight after uh, you know, like, for example, the, one of the most biggest, you know, situations that in relation to this that people can think of in recent memory was Canelo, Triple G, Canelo tested positive. Um, and then obviously the fight was canceled. They had a Golden Boy had a press conference about it and what have you. Um, why do you think a fight of this magnitude continued on? Uh, there can be a lot of factors, but I think the main one is money. Uh, Robinson. This is an opportunity for him, and I'm pretty sure he had to sign off on it. And I'm pretty sure he wanted that money. And I'm pretty sure he also wanted that challenge. He wanted to fight for that title. And I think because of that, he said, I'm not going to let it go. He says, I don't care if he tested positive. I'll say yes. You know, because if they cancel the fight, there's no guarantee that Robinson was going to get that fight again. And I'm sure he knew that. Because Valdez has his pick of the litter. This was just a, a nothing fight for all Valdez. He was just fighting to fight in front of his hometown fans. But for Robinson, it was everything. You know, he he already had looked pretty bad against Louis Correa. He may never get that chance again. So I think it was up to him. And he said, yes, let's do it. Yeah, I agree. I think that's one instance that a lot of people are forgetting in a situation like this that Robson had to sign off on this obviously if they asked him and he said no you know what I don't know what he took or what he has in his body I you know I, I'd rather not proceed with the fight um so I, I that's one thing that I thought of right away when when they announced this fight was proceeding and the event was pr- proceeding in general um was that well he had he signed off on it obviously they didn't you know they're not forcing him to do this so and that's exactly what i thought as well and i was explaining to to mike that he probably knew well this inter- this opportunity is right in front of me i'm he might not fight me even you know if he passes or if he you know the suspension goes by or anything like that um so that that brings me to the secondary point following up on that is you know it was a close fight you know there was a there was a couple people in the in the boxing media who had uh who had Robson actually winning 115 113 I actually saw a couple of those scores um but obviously Valdez uh received the nod from the uh judges uh in Arizona there on ESPN plus um Robson this week it was it was rep- it was actually not reported it was actually released that he filed a complaint with the WBC um you know he was alleging that the officiating was kind of suspect and then that the notion and then the, the notion that Valdez was still able to retain his title despite his positive test that was also a grievance that he filed I believe he bought he filed it with the WBC um you know following up on that point like we just talked about how he accepted the fight or accepted the fight following the fentermine positive test and now he's he submitted officially a complaint with the WBC uh pretty much regarding, you know, his grievances. How, how do you look at that? How do you react to something like that? Uh, it's pretty interesting that he filed a complaint, but I think basically he wants a rematch. Mm. And uh, I think that's that was the first step in getting a rematch, is that maybe the WBC will force Valdez to to do it again. And that there, there is a strong suspicion that they will do it again because of that. Uh, but he had to do that if he wanted the rematch. Because otherwise, Valdez will go after somebody else. He'll go after uh, Shakur Stevenson or somebody else. And and uh, I think Robinson had to do that. I'm sure his advisors told, told him to do that. So you, so you think, like, I, I just want to make sure that's accurate. You think that... Uh, it's a high. It's a higher possibility than than normal that the will, there will be a rematch. That Robson filing a complaint, obviously that's his goal. But you think it's more likely than not? Yeah, I think there is only because it was a close fight, and the fact that uh, 
he did fail a PED test, uh, opens the door for that. I mean, it has to open the door. And it might even go to the commission. Well, it's in Arizona, so that's a different thing. But um, it does open the door for, for that possibility of a rematch. Do you think the WBC really has the – and obviously they have some type of authority, but, you know, obviously the bigger the fighter, the more uh, pull, I guess, for lack of a better term, that a fighter has in the sport of boxing, um, the harder it is for WBC to com- for the WBC to compel them or, you know, have them kind of bend to their will, if you want to describe it like that. Do you think the WBC would be able to do that? Or do you think it would have to be top rank who kind of says like, Oh, you know, yeah, he'll do it. Or now we're going in another direction. Uh, it depends, you know, it depends on the kind of, uh, public clamor there is for that. Uh, I think, um, if they could sustain this kind of, uh, of support for a rematch, then yeah, there'll be a rematch because basically top rank wants to know, does this fight sell? Will a rematch sell? Now, if they're convinced that it's going to sell, they'll do it again. If it sells, if it d- doesn't look like, they'll just move on. Because basically, they know that with Oscar Valdez, they got somebody they can build on. And uh, I, I think that's what, it, it just depends on will that rematch sell. Right. Yeah, that, make, that makes total sense. Uh, in regards to the 117-110 score, that kind of got some scrutiny um, after it was announced, uh, the judge who actually had that score, his name is Stephen Blee or Blea, B L E A. I believe it's, yeah. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. He's a very good judge too. So but- he, he, he released, uh, a statement following mm-hmm. his, his, uh, score, which was, is very rare. Uh, we never mm-hmm. really see this. I don't, I don't remember mm-hmm. ever seeing something like this, at least not publicized. Um, he released a statement also this week saying that his score was not accurate and did not represent the actions in the ring. Um, and that he also acknowledged that some of the rounds that he tipped to Valdez, uh, he should have scored 10, 10. Um, and he pretty much gave Valdez the champion's advantage in those rounds. Um, what do you think? What do you think about that? Especially when you, when, when you saw the news that he, release some type of official statement, I believe through the WBC kind of taking accountability for his score. You know, he's actually a very good judge. He's a veteran judge. Everybody has a bad day. There's nobody perfect, especially in judging. That's the hardest thing in the world. I I like to look at a a TV and see all these fighters judge a fight or these uh, trainers. Trainers are the worst. Let me tell you, when they judge a fight, they are the worst. And I, I, I just laugh sometimes when I hear their scores. But uh, it's hard. It's very difficult because fighters and trainers and most fans aren't trained to judge a fight. They're just, you know, they're biased going into the fight. And for a judge to do it day in and day out and be perfect, yeah, it's almost impossible. And it usually depends on what you like. Like, do you like a slick runner who shows you defense and sh- shows you the mythical uh, ring generalship, which I don't believe in at all. I always come down to who hits who. That's it. I don't care about ring generalship. It's not a dance contest. <laughs> but uh, but there's a lot of East Coast judges that favor that. They love that term. But in the West Coast, it's we're more inclined to to pick a guy who's more aggressive and just lands more punches, especially effective punches. Not just pity pat punches like a lot of amateurs do, and Robinson Concesal uh, does, um, and Cubans in particular like to do that too. Uh, we don't count that. Uh, we kind of like strong punching, uh, punches that hurt, not punches that touch, but punches that hurt. So, where do you think Valdez goes from here? You mentioned, obviously, we talked about, you know, Robson is filing the complaint with the WBC to try to get a rematch. So that's obviously a possibility, but the initial plan, at least from top ranks uh, perspective was to get the winner of Herring and Shakur Stevenson, probably sometime maybe in the first quarter of next year or, or 
or at least the first four, five, six months of next year. Um, where do you, where do you think Valdez goes from here? If, if you had to put your money on it? Uh, well, he's in a position for a big money fight. He really is. Um, he's in a division that's heating up. Uh, it's actually a very strong division and there's so many directions he can go and make money. And I think top rank sees him in that position too. And they, they kind of like, I think that's why they made Herring and uh, Shakur. Uh, they, both those guys don't have massive crowd appeal. So they want one of them to knock off the other. And then maybe they can, one of them will face Valdez and make it a bigger fight. Do you think in, in regards to the Herring Stevenson fight, do you think Stevenson being the currently the favorite, do you think that's accurate? Uh, that's a hard fight. You know, Herring is such a, he shouldn't even be a champion to, to, in many people's eyes, but the guy keeps coming up with more and more ways to win. And he, he shows so many different, um, uh, elements to his game. He, he, he keeps bringing something new to the game. And with Shakur, we know he like he's got a lot of speed. He has some power, but he likes to run. So he doesn't have a lot of massive appeal because uh, other than the East Coast, the West Coast doesn't really like to see runners. And that's what Shakur is. He's a runner. And we'll see what happens when he uh, fights uh, Jamel Herring, who has long arms. He's tall. And it's going to be a different kind of... Uh, problem for uh, Shakur. So you think that fight is a lot closer than people think? Cause I mean, if you, a lot of the people we've talked to, and then, you know, the, a lot of the opinions we've seen on boxing, social media circles is that Stevenson should have, a, you know, is a big, big favorite and should, I don't want to say easily win, but you know, should have an easier time in a sense to get the victory. So you think that's not, that's not accurate at all. You think that Herring, really has a shot here. Yeah, I think so. I think Herring's shown that he's very intelligent and there is a way to beat Shakur. Well, he's not unbeatable. No fighter is unbeatable. Um, there is a way. You just got to cut off the ring. Whatever di- direction he likes to go, you got to take it away. Because he has a way. Uh, he's got a direction he likes to go. And he, he kind of disguises it by by going left and right and seeming like he likes to go both ways, but there is a dominant direction he likes to go. You take that away and all of a sudden you've got to fight. I mean, that's what happened with Floyd Mayweather. For years, everybody thought, well, nobody could keep up with his, his foot speed, but there was ways to cut up the ring as De La Hoya showed, as Cotto showed. There are ways to cut up a ring and make you fight. And if Herring has that kind of intelligence, then we'll see a good fight. We'll see them right in front of each other. That's true. So Valdez retains his WBC World Super Featherweight title. So, you know, coming off of a, a significant uh, and highly publicized win against Miguel Burchell earlier this year, and then, you know, going and testing positive for the fence remain highs and lows in boxing. I'm sure you've seen many of those in your career. So we'll see where he goes, especially in the next, you know, six months or so. Also on that card, Junto Nakatani uh, remains undefeated as he gets a TKO win over Angel Acosta. And this was for the WBO World Flyweight title. Um, did you catch Did you catch clips of this fight, David? Yeah. And if you did, uh, you know, what do you think about it? And what do you what do you what do you think about Nakatani in this win? Well, well, I knew that Nakatani was good. And I knew exactly uh, um, what was gonna, what the Boricua was going to bring. I knew it was going to be close because both guys could hit. I didn't know if Nakatani had a chin or not. And But I was betting, uh, I was hedging toward Nakatani. I, I took part in a couple of uh, predictions, and I said Nakatani, I was hedg- hedging toward him because just because he was undefeated and nobody had knocked him down or out, and whereas... Uh, it wasn't that way for the Puerto Rican fighter. So other, you know, highly ranked uh, flyweights in, in that division at the moment are Sonny Edwards, uh, Mick Williams, Arroyo, and Julio Cesar Martinez. Uh, you know, 
who do you think would be a good matchup for a Nakatani? Um, would it be Martinez? Would it be Edwards? Would it be Arroyo or maybe somebody I didn't mention? I kind of like Martinez. I, I think that's a really good fight. I think that'll be action packed. Uh, Martinez is a rough customer. Uh, I don't know who gets the. I don't know who gets the advantage in that fight either. I mean, that's to me, that's a toss up fight. I know that Nagatani's worked in. He's been to L.A. before and worked in L.A. with some of the fighters there, and so I knew what he could he can do. So he's familiar with the Mexican style, and uh, I think that would be a great fight. I, I don't know who would win that fight though. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'd, I'd want to see the Martinez fight, um, and I'm sure. Uh, do you know if Nakatani is he signed to Top Rank, or is this just a fight like a one off fight that he had with with under the Top Rank banner? Uh, I'm not really positive about that. Uh, so I'm not could, really sure. Right. So it could be it could be possible that he's kind of like on a one fight deal here, and he could possibly go to the zone and fight Martinez with you know the Eddie Hearn matchroom banner yeah it's very, it's very possible i'm not sure i'm if he's with top rank at all right yeah it doesn't seem like it so i'm i'm, I'm assuming it'd be easy for him uh to go and fight martinez on the zone uh which you know would make everything easier when there's no promotional politics kind of standing in the way um you know moving on on that card uh luis alberto lopez gets the upset win uh unanimous decision over gabriel flores jr uh who suffers a first loss of his young career uh and flores was obviously a highly touted fighter and prospect for top rank since they signed him um when you saw this news that flores had t- took the loss what was your reaction uh i was a little surprised but uh, i could see why they batched them tough like that uh, they wanted to see if he could fight. I mean, because you have so many undefeated prospects, and and but eventually you want to find out can the guy fight? I don't want to carry him forever. You know, they want to see, and they found out. You know that he can fight, but he didn't have the power to to keep the other guy away from him. And uh, it, it's funny because I saw them, I saw him spar a couple of times in Riverside, and because. Uh, he was sparring at uh, Robert Garcia's uh, boxing academy, and I could see he had the speed and technique, but I never saw the power. I never saw it at all. And uh, he just had enough just to hit you, but not to really hurt you. And I was wondering if he was going to be able to go up to the next level, like uh, Paul Malinaji, who didn't have a lot of power, but enough to stop you where you wouldn't, just go through his punches. And uh, that's what happened. You, you, you found out against Lopez. Do you think, because uh, obviously when a fighter suffers a loss, especially after a string of, uh, you know, multiple victories, or especially if they're undefeated and they have a loss um, after, for example, 20 wins, like, like Flores did here, a lot of, we see a lot of fighters uh, change trainers. Do you think, this is something that Flores Jr. Uh, needs in his camp and his and you know for his training regimen. And if yes, who would you th- who would you see or who would you see the best fit for him? Gee, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, Robert Garcia is really good. I mean, and and he was working with him. I don't know if he was working. Was he working with him in this fight? I don't remember. Uh, you know what? I I, I don't believe so. Um, I know his dad works with yeah, him. Yeah, his dad worked for him, and that that was also another another issue there. As uh, I guess uh, Flores was taking a lot of punishment, um, especially in the last couple rounds, and uh, his dad his dad was getting a lot of criticism for letting him continue, even though he a lot of people like a lot of spectators and viewers of the of this matchup thought that his father should have stopped the fight because um, he saw him taking too much punishment and pretty much losing the fight. Um, you know, did you did you read about that? Did you hear about that? And if you did, what what's your take on a situation like that, especially with a father son dynamic? Yeah, you know, um, when a father is involved, especially from the beginning in amateurs, and then they go to the pros, and they always think they can still coach them even in the pros, and it never works out well. 
because the pro style and amateur style are completely different. And even if you say, well, it's not that different, it is different. Pro style is much different than amateurs. And you could be a gold medalist and be undefeated. And, and then you go to the pros and you get knocked out because that's, you know, pity pass stuff doesn't work. And I, I think the father really has to take himself out of the equation and just let the pros work with him. Because I think that's his only uh, that's his only chance of, of moving on. He's got to uh, get away from the father. The father is taking him as far as he can go. I, I can imagine Oscar De La Hoya's dad training him all the way. You know that would have been sad, also. I mean, but he went the pro route. He said, "Hey, I'm gonna let the pros work with him." And you need that. You need that. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I agree with that. Um, rounding off that card, Xander Zayas also remains undefeated. Another uh, highly touted prospect under the top ranked banner. I uh, guess the unanimous decision win over Jose Luis Sanchez. Um, you know, what's your take on on Zayas as you know as a young fighter at the moment? At the moment, and when do you think um, he'll receive his first? Uh, like we just talked about Flores, top rank putting Flores in with like somebody who can test him. When do you think? that's going to happen for uh, Xander. Yeah, it's, he's in the same situation as as, uh, as all of those pro- undefeated prospects. He hasn't really come up to the competition yet. They're still trying to teach him things. And they they have to be careful because even though he's got all the tools, well, he's got tools, he doesn't have all the tools. He just, he's learning. He's still learning. He's got great offensive uh, firepower and he, he's a good athlete but he's still learning it's a little early for him i think i think he's still got another year and a half to go before he really will meet somebody at at the b plus level he right now he's in the c plus level but uh, he's he's got a little ways to go yeah i agree with that i think he's it's still a while before we're going to see him really get battle tested. Uh, also moving on this past Saturday, the 11th of September, uh, the next edition of Triller fight club from the Seminole hard rock hotel and casino in Hollywood, Florida. Vitor Belfort uh, gets the fur. Actually, no, this was an exhibition, so it wasn't even a professional bout, uh, but he gets, I guess the stoppage win over uh, the 59 year old, Evander Holyfield, who stepped in on short notice after the golden boy, Oscar De La Hoya, who was originally headlined to, to headline this matchup, um, tested positive for COVID. Unfortunately, I think he's okay now. Um, you know, Holyfield was stopped in the, in the first round of the, the referee at least stopped it in the first round. Um, what'd you think about that? I don't know if you saw it, but when you, know, I'm sure you saw clips and, and the news, what did you think about that when you saw that Holyfield was stopped? Um, and, you know, did you think Holyfield should have been in there? You know, you never know uh, how uh, how much is left in a fighter uh, until they get in the ring. I mean, they could look great. Uh, I always remember when Sugar Ray Leonard came out of retirement and fought Hector Camacho, and he looked perfect. He looked like this chiseled body he looked perfect and then he got his butt kicked i mean my camacho is a much smaller guy and that happens you know it, you can look good but once you get in the ring it was obvious that holyfield didn't have any legs i mean you could you could just push him and he'd fall down you know the legs just weren't there i mean the heart is willing and he just doesn't have it he should never step in the ring again against anybody <laughs> how do you think obviously we're not going to know I'm, but i'm sure in the next six months or so we'll we'll find out as he's going to want to get in the ring uh soon but how do you think uh if de la hoya didn't uh catch covid19 the last couple of weeks how do you think he would have done against a vitor belfort because belfort you know he's younger i believe he's younger than de la hoya and you know he's still a pretty uh you know tough guy and he seems like he's still in good shape. How do you think a fight like that would have went down? Uh, it's, you know, 
shadow. I saw Oscar shadow boxing. It's it's hard to tell if a person has his legs because shadow boxing is one thing, but uh, actually fighting and having to move side to side and and move away from a, an attack is a totally different thing. And you can your punches may be there, but are your legs are your legs under you? That's the most important thing for an athlete is his legs. And uh, I don't know. You know, it's really hard to tell unless Oscar actually gets in there. I mean, he had decades of hard living, you know? I mean, not just, he wasn't just retired. He was living hard. (laughs) And uh, it's funny because he looked in shape, but that doesn't mean anything. I actually met with him two weeks ago on Monday in his office. I was sitting right next to him. And then three or four days later, he said he had COVID. But uh, I was there, and he looked okay. You know, he looked in shape, but you never know if the legs are there. And Oscar really needs his legs. His whole style is based on his legs. And he has a chin. And then the other thing, too, is that uh, what's going to happen if uh, Belfort hits him in the body, you know? The body doesn't lie. I mean, you get hit there, and it's all over. I don't know. It's just hard to say with Oscar. So you mentioned, uh, Dave, that you were there a couple of days before it was announced that he had COVID um, at right there at the at, at his office in Los Angeles. Um, I mean, you said he didn't really look too different. I mean, did you notice anything? Like, if you know, if you looked at him, did he look maybe pale or did he look a little tired? Or I mean, what was your what was your take on him when you were right there a couple of days before? He looked a little tired. He did look. I I, I don't know if it was because he was doing the. Uh, the rounds of different media groups, uh, television. He was doing a lot of television. In fact, uh, there was about three of us there, four of us, and we had to wait for about two hours for him to finish. So he was doing all those rounds in his offices, and then he came to us in the conference room, and he sat with us for about half an hour. But he did look a little tired. I don't know if it was for that or because he had COVID. I don't know. But uh, he, he seemed to be okay, and then a few days later, he said he had it. Yeah, I mean, I think he, I believe he's, he's he's okay now. But you know, it was a it was an unfortunate some unfortunate news at at the time. But um, luckily, I believe he's okay now. Um, and also, you know, with that, before moving on, like uh, the former president Donald Trump was actually a guest commentator on this event, uh, which. Get, probably got a lot more publicity than the actual fight itself, but that was a an interesting uh, situation there. Um, also on the card, Anderson Silva defeated Tito Ortiz via KO. Um, also in the first round with an overhand right um, at the one minute and twenty one second mark, as I mentioned of the first round. Um, you know, Silva. I mean, he's done a couple of these. You know, these type of fights now. Um, I think he previously fought, I think it was this last fight, he defeated Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. in Mexico. Um, when you heard that news, that he defeated Ch- Chavez Jr. in Mexico, what what was your reaction to that? I mean, did you just think like, oh, well, it's Chavez Jr. or or did you think, well, Silva is actually kind of good? I had heard from people that know Silva, that work with him, that he was a pretty good boxer. They, they had told me that uh, this is years ago because years, uh, I forget when it was, but there was talk of him fighting Roy Jones Jr. This was when uh, Roy was still active and they were gonna they're thinking about doing that. And the people I knew, because he would train in Long, Long Beach, were saying that Sip was pretty good. Don't underestimate him. So I had that knowledge from good sources that told me Silva could fight. That as a boxer, he was pretty good. So when he beat Chavez, I said, oh, okay, the rumors are true. <laughs> he can box. He has some, you know, boxing ability. And so I wasn't entirely shocked. I was surprised that he beat Chavez because Chavez is a world-class fighter. Maybe he's not the level of his dad, but he's still world-class. He's fought Canelo. He's fought everybody. And, um, yeah, so Silva's a real deal, you know. He's a good athlete. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he does it again and fights somebody 
else. Maybe he'll find Belfort. <laughs> Who knows? That's true. Yeah, he might. I mean, he he might be end up after all this, you know, this type of fights and celebrity fights or whatever you want to label it as. He might be the one who stand at the finish line with the most success. Uh, so who knows? But we'll, we'll, we'll see when we get there. Uh, also rounding off the card, two more bouts. Jono Carroll uh, gets the majority decision win over Andy Vences uh, by scores of 95, 95 and 97, 93 twice for Carroll. Uh, and also David Hay. Uh, returns and gets the unanimous decision win over Joe Fournier. I believe I pronounced that right. Um, This bout was actually classified as an exhibition uh, in California before it was moved to Florida when De La Hoya tested positive for COVID. Um, So I believe Florida also categorized it as an exhibition, um, unless I'm I'm mistaken, but I didn't see any other news uh, otherwise. Um, But the news out of this fight was that, hey, obviously called out Tyson Fury following his exhibition win. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about situations like that, especially when fighters haven't fought in a while and they come back and they call out like the biggest name? Is this, do you think David Hay is serious about getting in the ring with the, with the Tyson Fury or, or do you think it was just more to just to make some headlines and get some publicity out of it? No, oh, I'm sure he wants that fight. That's a big money fight. He's just looking for a payday, but uh, I don't think he's relevant anymore. I mean, he hasn't been relevant in years, and I don't think, I don't care what he does, he's never going to be ready for Tyson Fury. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was picked up in a couple of publications. He did get some traction on it, especially uh, in, in the UK. I think I saw it on Sky and, and stuff like that. So, it kind of worked in some form. So, but, but we'll see. You know, I'd be surprised if Fury gives him a shot. Uh, but crazier things have happened. Um, <laughs> also, this past weekend, uh, I believe it was actually Friday, uh, the 10th of September on zone from Austria, uh, Philip Hergovic gets the TKO win over Marco Rand- Randajic, Randonchik, I believe I pronounced that right, hopefully not, uh, in a heavyweight matchup for the IBF International Heavyweight title. Um, you know, Hergovic is six foot six. Uh, he made his deb- debut a couple of years ago, so he hasn't been pro for that long. Um, but you know, these, y- these, these younger heavyweights, uh, I will, Hergovich is 29 years old. So he's about right there with the other guys like, you know, Fury, Joshua Wilder, he's in that same general category. Um, but you know, he's 13 to know these, these heavyweights who are trying to get into the discussion with like the Furies, the Wilders, the Joshua's and stuff like that. Um, you know, what, what's the, what's the recipe to, to really get those guys to notice him? Is it just keep winning and then keep being like better and better guys? Or what do you think? Yeah, you, you, you just gotta, most people like knockouts. And if you're a heavyweight, you got to produce knockouts. You can't just win. You Knockouts are the only way. That's why guys like Joyce and, and uh, who's the other guy? Uh, the other British fighter, I was uh, Dynamite Dubois. Yeah, mm-hmm. fighters of that ilk, you know, they're they're always going to be there because people like knockouts. They they really don't care about uh, decision wins. Uh, I'm actually surprised that uh, that Usyk is getting this title shot. Uh, he's a good fighter, but he's not a knockout puncher, and uh, but he does have a shot against uh, Anthony Joshua. He does have a shot. Yeah, so that fight is actually, I believe, next week, the 25th of September. And since you brought that up, Dave, you know, what's your, you know, obviously you mentioned that uh, Usyk probably, he, it's not that he doesn't have power. He obviously, uh, his his main, his primary success so far in his career has been at cruiserweight. Um, and now moving up to heavyweight, he's obviously facing the toughest test in the, or one of the toughest tests in the heavyweight division, but in probably his entire career at this point. Um, do you think that the power that AJ has um, would kind of be the X factor in that, in that matchup against Usyk? Yeah, I think so. I think um, Joshua has speed for a big guy. He's not super fast, but he's not slow. And he does have power. And if he touches you, you're going down. And uh, Usyk, uh, he's a good mover, very good mover. I don't know. 
if he has enough power to hurt Joshua, but if Andy Reid can could uh, knock him out, then maybe Usyk has a shot. Right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. You know, if Ruiz kind of caught him. Uh, maybe Usyk does have a shot, so we'll see. Um, you know, but that's definitely an interesting matchup. Um, you know, I give credit to Anthony Joshua. I mean, do you think that? And uh, tell me if you agree with me on this or not. But do you think that Joshua, Anthony Joshua, at the moment, out of all the heavyweights, especially the the upper echelon of heavyweights, do you think he's probably had the toughest fights so far in his career? Um, if you go by resumes, um. No, I think they're all pretty much equal. Well, not all of them, but uh, I think uh, Joshua and Fury are pretty equal. I mean, they both uh, faced uh, top competition. Uh, Fury beating uh, Klitschko and and beating uh, uh, Deontay Wilder. That's pretty good competition. And Joshua's faced his own nemesis and Andy Ruiz and He's done his own thing too with the uh, Klitschko. So yeah, they they're about equal. They're about equal in my estimation. What do you think's victory over Klitschko was more impressive? Was it Anthony Joshua's or Tyson Fury's? Because obviously Anthony Joshua's was more of like a it was a spectacle. You know, they not each one went down and then Joshua stops him. So in terms of entertainment that was a, you know, a very, very special fight, but, you know, in terms of um, who beat the, the more well-rounded Klitschko, do you think it was Fury or, or was it AJ? It seemed to be Fury. And back, uh, I was talking with Tom Loeffler who worked with the uh, Klitschkos and he was pretty impressed with Fury. He was telling me the way Fury beat him was kind of a shock to him because he had never seen the Klitschkos, any of the Klitschkos get beat up like that. Um, not in decades, not since. Well, I, I saw Vladimir get beat by um, uh, Brewster a decade earlier, but but other than that, you know, he had a long run. And when Fury came along, you know, nobody expected him to do what he did against Chris, uh, Vladimir. Right, yeah, that was definitely... Uh, a surprise at that moment because I think Klitschko was the favorite going into that fight and Fury ended up uh, taking the decision win there. Um, moving on to fight preview this upcoming Saturday and Sunday, the 18th and 19th uh, from the Mechanics Bank Arena in Bakersfield, California, a PBC card on Fox Sports 1 uh, on 918, which is this Saturday. Jose Valenzuela goes up against Danir Daner Berrio in a 10 round lightweight matchup. Uh, and then Malik Montgomery versus Aleem Jumikanov uh, is the main event on Sunday, September 19th. This is a super featherweight matchup, a 10 round bout. Um, you know, have you ever been to a fight in Bakersfield, Dave? And if you have, what do you, what do you think about the fans and, you know, the, uh, the locations and arenas up there? Well, I've never been there for a fight. Uh, I do have uh, friends that come from those areas, Colano and Bakersfield and those areas. Um, and I know that they're big fight fans. Uh, like uh, Ruben Castillo came from that area. He comes from uh, Bakersfield. And uh, so they, they do like boxing, but I've never actually seen a fight in that area. Have we ever had, if at least from what you can remember, has there any? has there been any significant name or somebody that stands out in your mind that came from that area, the Bakersfield area, uh, that kind of had some, some success in boxing? Well, just Ruben Castillo, he comes to mind. I mean, he did it very well. He fought, she, he fought everybody. He fought Arguello, he fought Ruben Olivares, he fought uh, Julio Cesar Chavez, you name it, he fought him. And Salvador Sanchez. Yep. And a lot of people thought he beat Salvador Sanchez. And if you ask him, he beats Salvador Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Don't don't ever ask him because you'll get him mad. <laughs> well, I won't. I won't. If I ask him, I'll I'll make sure to I'll make sure to preface it with, uh, "Hey, uh, David Avila told me to ask you this," so <laughs> I'll make sure to to preface it like that. Um, and then uh, news and notes of this week's episode of the last round. Uh, Kevin Ioli of Yahoo Sports reported this week 
uh, that Terrence Crawford and Sean Porter have struck a deal for about on November 20th on ESPN plus likely an ESPN plus ESPN plus pay-per-view um, at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Um, what was your reaction to this news, Dave? And, um, you know, did you have any type of high hopes that this was going to get done? Cause honestly, I didn't, I thought some, for some reason or another, it wasn't going to work out just because of PBC top rank and the, the, the luck that Crawford's had over the years. I mean, what was your reaction? Um, I actually was very uh, positive that it was going to happen. Uh, I mean, knowing uh, Porter, Porter doesn't shy away from anybody. He doesn't care. He He's just a real fighter. Of all the welterweights, he's the realest of all of them. And um, I knew that he would say yes, no matter what. So I knew it was just a matter of time, them sorting out the details and who gets the money and who, what venue and who's going to do the media, all that stuff, that once they sorted that out, it was going to get done. Because all I knew that Porter was going to say yes. He's going to say yes. Okay, yes. As long as we fight, yes. That, that's just the way he is. I, I, that's what I like about him. He's just a gung-ho fighter. And Terrence Crawford, you know, he wants a big fight. So he wasn't going to stop that fight either. He wants a way to prove that he belongs at the very top. So who do you think, uh, you know, who, who do you think as of this moment today, uh, who's the favorite? Who would you lean towards? Well, from what I've read and heard and everybody's picking Crawford, but I kind of like Porter. Mm. I really do. I really like his style. I think he presents a lot of problems because he, um, he doesn't give you room. Kind of reminds me of a Henry Armstrong kind of guy. He's just right in your chest, you know. He's right there. He's going to find a way to be right in your chest. And it's hard to fight a person like that, you know. He's right there. You can catch him, but you better catch him because he's going to be right in your right in your grill, like they say. So, you know, talking about that, following up on that, so, you know, if, if you ask anybody, like, oh, who's the probably toughest test to fight in the welterweight division at the moment, you know, I think everybody or a lot of people would say Errol Spence because he has multiple titles. He's probably considered the best fighter at the moment at 147. But Sean Porter has fought all of these guys, Spence, Garcia, mm -hmm. you know, and he's and they've all had kind of pretty difficult, a difficult time with him. But what, what did you think? Yeah, I agree with you that I think I would lean towards Porter. And that's not that a, a knock against Crawford. I just, I think Porter just, you know, it, it, he, he, he just has that in him where he just makes it so difficult for you. You're just so tired at the end of the fight after you fight him. Um, but well, I mean, would you agree that like out of all the fighters at the 147 division that Porter would give you like, you know, the most, I don't want to label it as the most difficult test, but like you'd be, you'd definitely be exhausted by the end of the fight against a Porter. Yeah, I, I agree. I really agree because uh, I was there when he fought Spence. I thought if he doesn't get knocked down, he wins that fight. Mm -hmm. He would have won that fight if he didn't get knocked down uh, because the scores were still close. They weren't, it wasn't this widespread decision. He barely won by one round, basically. And no knockdown, Porter wins the fight. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely still a close fight. That people, a lot of people don't re don't remember it, you know, as close. They just remember Spence getting the win. But Porter's always in these fights. He always figured out figures out a way to to really stick his his you know his neck out there and figure out how to get close to a, a win there. Um, you know, Mike Coppinger of ESPN followed up saying that um, Crawford will reportedly earn around six million. And Porter will earn four million. So obviously that was a big sticking point, and it seems like they got across the finish line there. So that's on November twentieth, as I mentioned on ESPN Plus pay per view. So that's something we look forward to. Hopefully nothing happens now. Being between now and then, um, and then also Top Rank announced this week the WBO featherweight champion Emmanuel Navarrete will defend it, defend his title against. Uh, Glendora, California's Joette Gonzalez on October 15th at the Pachanga Arena in San Diego. What do you think about this matchup, Dave? Um, I think uh, it's a hard fight. 
Gonzalez, he likes, uh, he's, he's actually a very clean fighter. And Navarrete likes to hold a lot. And if he doesn't prepare for that, he's going to be befuddled and, and, and just frustrated. And Navarrete will win the fight. But if, if Choet can solve that puzzle of the holding, then he'll do well. But it, it's that holding. Navarrete is really good at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, well, I should have been, he, I take that back. He's not, he doesn't always do that, but you know he knows how to do it. He's a, he's a rough customer. He's rough. He's very rough. And then, as I mentioned, this fight is in San Diego, a rare uh, fight for the San Diego area. Um, do you think that boxing should capitalize more on the San Diego area for you know more significant fights? Uh, that's a good question. You know, it's um, I've been to fight cards there, and they weren't really well attended. It seems like, uh, but, you know, things can change. The dynamics can change. The population can change. But when I went there, I, I saw Chavez fight there. I saw Marco Antonio Barrera fight there. And they never really got big crowds. And so that's why promoters kind of stayed away from there. I mean, other than the smaller club shows, but the bigger ones, they just didn't do that well. Um, I don't remember. Oh, crowds were way back when Ali fought there, but they they probably were better. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that's just the problem because it didn't seem to be a, a real, real boxing town. But maybe it's changed because they got a lot of gyms now in San Diego. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just needs that one, uh, you know, big attraction fight. Maybe even a Canelo. Who knows? I, I mean, I doubt he'll fight there, mm -hmm. especially fighting in California with the the tax rate. That, that we have here, but, um, you know, if they get like a big fight like that and kind of get the community or the, you know, people of San Diego or that general area going, uh, maybe it invites more promoters to start bringing fights there, but we'll see. Um, before we, uh, I let you go here, Dave, I once again, appreciate your time here on the last round. I wanted to get your prediction on the Teofimo Lopez versus George Cambosis, uh, unified lightweight world title fight on October 4th, a Monday actually, at New York's uh, Madison Square Garden Hulu Theater. What do you think about that matchup? Uh, I kind of like Teo Pimo. I think he's just a great athlete, and he has very good boxing skills. Um, I took him over uh, Lomachenko, too, and uh, I just think he's a great athlete. I, I, to me, he, he's just a special athlete. He just... He, he can box, of course, and he has skills, but he's just a super athlete. I, that's what I see. I see a super athlete, and you don't see them that often in boxing. I mean, I, you saw it in Roy Jones. You saw it in Floyd Mayweather. You see it in Robert Guerrero, who a lot of people didn't know was a great athlete. People like that, they kind of excel. They just have this athleticism in them, and that's the way I see uh, Teofimo. And then also on October 9th, just a couple of weeks, about a week, a couple of days after that fight, actually, that weekend, uh, Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder meet for the third time in Las Vegas uh, in a trilogy matchup in their heavyweight uh, contentious fight here. Uh, who wins this third fight, Dave? Uh, you know, it's funny because I really like De Deontay Wilder. I really do. I, I, I like him as a person. I like him as a fighter, but I think Fury just dominates him. I just do. I just, I, I felt that in the second fight, he was going to knock him out. And I think in the third fight, he's going to knock him out too, even though I don't want it. I, I want Wilder to win, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, Wilder seems to be training hard and posting a lot of videos and <laughs> yeah. trying to show people that he's, you know, trying to take this seriously, which, you know, he, I'm sure he always yeah. does, but, um, I mean, what if Tay Fury kind of knocks him out again or stops him again, how, especially in, in some type of similarity form that he did in the last fight. I mean, where does Wilder go from there? I mean, you know, cause sometimes fighters, it hits their ego so hard that they just can't continue anymore. Or, and if they do continue, uh, that they're not ever the same fighter. You know what I mean? I mean, do you think that would happen yeah. to somebody like Wilder? I don't know. You know, I'm, 
I kind of see him. He's kind of like an Ernie Shavers kind of guy. He got he's got power. He can crack. Mm-hmm. And as long as you got that power, you're gonna sell because people are gonna want to see you knock out somebody. And I think even if he even if it turns out he has a glass chin, I don't think he does, but even if he were to have one, just the fact that he can knock you out, I mean, people want to see him fight. I mean, because he's got that kind of of a skill set. He's a dangerous guy. He's very dangerous. And, you know, obviously Fury Joshua is like the big fight they, they want to make across the pond in the UK that, uh, you know, would be a big, big stadium fight um, in one of their soccer stadiums over there. But let's just say Wilder wins. Um I, is there a fourth? Is there? Is there? Do you think there's a fourth? I don't know if it's been reported or not, but do you think there's a fourth matchup that if Wilder wins, Fury gets a rematch on his end? Wow, I'd be I'd be surprised, but hey, if it sells, <laughs> yeah, I, I always tell people, hey, if a fight sells, it's going to happen, mm-hmm. yeah, because that's all they really care about making money. It, it's that's the reason we have all these uh, social media guys you know, fighting because they make money. <laughs> right. Jake Paul makes money. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a business at the end of the day. And these networks, uh, yeah, they, absolutely. they see, you know, some type of profit line there and they're like, Hey, well, why not? You know, it's entertainment exactly. at the end of the day. So I get it. I get it. Well, uh, David Avila, I appreciate your time here on the last round before I let you go here. Uh, go ahead and let our listeners know where they can uh, find your work and follow you on social media and anything else, obviously you have upcoming in your career. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm under Avila boxing and they can also even find me on Facebook. Uh, I still do Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. That's where I contact most of my, my uh, worldwide audience. And then uh, I'm, I work for the, Newspaper group, uh, Southern California News Group, uh, on occasion, not as much as uh, I used to. And I work for the prizefighters.com and the sweet science.com and Uppercut Magazine. And those are the, uh, oh, and La Prensa. Those are all the people I work with. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely a busy guy, man. You have your, uh, your, your work spread all over the place, which is good, though. You know, you're, you're, you're uh, immersed in the in the boxing world as you've been for the last several years. Um, but once again, I appreciate your time, Dave. And as I'm signing off here uh, for episode 144, Mike will be back next week with me. So special thanks to David Avila, journalist and writer. Is that how you would want to be called, David? Uh, you know, a journalist yeah, writer. Yeah, because I yeah. know. Cause I know I, I believe on one of your profiles, it says boxing beat writers. So, you know, some, cause some people like certain type of uh, titles. So that's why I like to ask what you, what you would label yourself as, would it be yeah, a, a writer journalist? Yeah. Journalist writer. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. Great. Great. So once again, for our guest of the week in David Avila, I'm Danny Z. This is the last round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.